if there was ever an interview that made you feel like you were there, like you were just hanging out with your boys, you popped open a beer, and y'all was just shooting the shit, this was that interview. Quite honestly, and yes, it was an hour and 30 minutes, they could have kept going. I would have been absolutely enthralled if they went another hour and 30 minutes. Shoot! I hope they do a part two. I hope this next episode is Taker and Austin part two. They can talk about more stories. They can talk about much more things. I don't care. I would watch the entire thing. But I love this. This was an excellent return for Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm so happy he's back doing podcasts. I understand it was a little difficult for him to do it after his interview with Dean Ambrose, John Moxley. But it was still something I don't think WWE should have dropped. I thought it was a mistake to drop it. It it was just stupid of them. But it's back now. Can't complain too much about it. So what we're going to do, we're just going to recap the show. I'm going to give my thoughts on what was said, tell you what was said first, then give you my, give you my thoughts about it, and then we're just going to have some fun. And of course, as I talk about it, feel free to donate. Super Chats are not managed tonight. It can go crazy as much as it wants to go. So if you donate, it will appear here on the screen. I'll let it play, and then we're just going to continue. So, what I thought was really cool was the explanation of why the show was called Broken Skull Sessions. Austin reveals that he got the name from the fact that he broke his skull. Broke his head to get to the top in WWE. I think about his match with Bret Hart where blood was gushing down his face. Just that iconic look. Him being dropped on his head by Owen Hart. By accident, but still, like he had a ton of head injuries. He literally had to break his skull to get to the top. So it makes sense. Broken skull. That's awesome. So we see him and Taker sit down. Austin starts talking, and he asks Taker how he feels. And Taker says, after 30 years, he's doing okay. He has made some changes to his diet and training and feels as good as he can. At what, 56, 57 years old? Uh, they start talking about just how things were back in 1989 when they first met each other. I think they met each other in Dallas? Yeah, it, it was one of those things where it was just rehashing how they got started. Austin says they both have a lot in common, which is being born in Texas. How you doing? Houstonian here. Yes, sir. Take us from Houston, Texas, like me. Austin's from Austin, Texas. Uh, Austin became a fan when watching Houston wrestling. And wants to know how Taker became a fan. His story is similar as to uh, how he grew up in Houston uh, and, and watching Houston wrestling. And I think they were fans of, was that Paul Bosch? Paul Bosch, I think they said. Don't ask me who he is. I don't know anything about Paul Bosch. Just don't, because it's way before my time. But they started talking about... Um, Buzz Sawyer, I know who that is. Taker started training under Buzz Sawyer. Puts him over that he was a heck of a trainer and a shooter, but not the greatest human being. Oh no. That seems to be like how... That seems to be the typical wrestling trainer back in the day. Yeah, that, that seems about right, honestly. Taker started training with him with a few other guys at Buzz's house. They went to his house for the first time, and Buzz was standing naked at his door. So he was just... A kind of a nasty out of his mind kind of guy which again it's very typical in wrestling just saying but he trained them uh, for the first few months there really wasn't anything going on taker didn't really know didn't really learn much with this guy which says a lot but he was athletic and no and people knew Paul Bozick was the promoter in Houston. And apparently he was like in charge of the territories in Houston and stuff like that. But again, I, I don't know much about him. You would think I would because he's from Houston, but I don't. I'm just being honest with you. 
Um, from there, Taker went to Memphis and Austin asked what he learned what he learned down there in Memphis, which is Jerry King Lawler. That's his territory. He says he learned what the business is all about. He had to eat some crap sandwiches and push people around who were greener than him. You know, uh, and that's just how it is. You know, people who were not good. It was clear. Taker was an athletic man from back in the day when he was me, Mark, me, Mark Calloway. He's always been athletic. That's just it. People look at Taker right now and they think he was crazy. Imagine how great he was in his prime. In his younger days, Taker's always been good. That's never changed. But he brings up Soul Taker. That's Papa Shango, a.k.a. The Godfather. Oh, my God. That's... Well, he was also, um... Who... It was Papa Shango, Godfather. Who was he in Nation of Domination? Whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, he was well-known back then, and... They didn't know what to do with them. So they made him a tag team. Woo! Tag team and... Imagine that tag team. Godfather and The Undertaker. That's funny. Austin brings up his run in Memphis, and they put him in a match with Taker. By then, he was called the Punisher. Taker called the match, and Austin talks about how Taker would breathe and makes you know make all these weird noises over calling spots. Austin couldn't understand him, and so Taker shot on him. He just, he just, he just had to start beating on him because he, he wasn't doing the spots right. And Taker says Austin may have been lost, but you could see something in him. And Austin has told the story before. He's told this many times before. He was awful when he first started wrestling. Just absolute garbage. Which is one of those, that's one of those stories you listen to and go, we have to start giving these young wrestlers time to grow. We can't just expect that they're going to fail. When they first get in here. Like, again, Stone Cold Steve Austin is one of the greatest of all time. I'd say he's number one. But when he first started, he sucked. Imagine if he was starting nowadays with how social media is. Everyone saw him wrestle. They'd be like, he will never be anything. Shut up. Get out of the business. He wouldn't be Austin. Who He would never become the Stone Cold Steve Austin that we know him as if he started nowadays. And that's kind of sad. But it, it was interesting hearing that story. Austin tells the story of a six-man tag in Tennessee, and Austin needed a ride to the show. They tell him to drive with Taker because they were both from Texas. Taker turned heel around that time, and back then, heels didn't ride with baby faces. They had to keep kayfabe. They were still trying to protect kayfabe. Although, around the 90s, it was starting to lose its luster, it was still very pro uh, prominent. They were still trying to make it feel real as possible around that point. But they couldn't ride together because of that. When Taker told Austin this, he told Taker to be careful as he's going to stretch him the next time they're in the ring. And Taker was like, bitch, what, what did you, what'd you say to me? Let's just, you're going to stretch me? <laughs> so, and they're just going back and forth, just, just having fun. And I'm just, I'm just laughing. This is the part of the interview where I went, Taker is hilarious. Like, I, I feel like... I feel like I should know this because he's had his moments where he made me laugh, especially when he was American Badass Taker. But, like, he was, he is a naturally funny guy. Like, yo, I didn't know, I didn't know you were funny. Like, he, he's just, he's just really awesome, man. Just to, just to see him be himself as Mark, it's, it's really, really cool. We jump to WCW, and Austin wants the story on how Taker got started there. And, Long story short, the only thing I want to talk about here is what he was told in WCW. Because you always wonder why Taker never really did anything in WCW. Why, during the Monday Night Wars, why he didn't go to WCW. Well, that's because during his time there, we had some dumbasses in charge tell Taker, you will never sell a goddamn seat in the business. A man like you will never make money in wrestling. This was Ole Anderson, I believe. If I'm not mistaken. I think I have notes on who said that. What was it, Ole, An Ole Anderson? Yeah, Ole Anderson told him that nobody will ever pay to see him wrestle. Like, holy crap! As you can imagine, that was like a dagger to his heart. 
And he was like, okay, well, I'm done with WCW. Screw you. I wouldn't ever go back to WCW after that. I, I, man, <laughs> it's no wonder he never went back. Like, I'm pretty sure if WCW never told him, like, any of these statements, he probably would have jumped during the Monday Night Wars. But, I mean, when WCW rejects you and then you go work for Vince, and not only does Vince McMahon give you an opportunity, but he gives you the greatest gimmick in all of sports entertainment, sports entertainment, but all of wrestling, of course you, of course you're gonna remain loyal. You kinda get why Taker is always doing Vince favors now, cause it's like if Vince wasn't around, we wouldn't be here. Everything we have when it comes to the Undertaker, I gotta be honest, we owe to Vince McMahon. We owe it all to Vince McMahon. So, speaking of Vince McMahon, we gotta get to this story. Taker was going to have a meeting at Vince's house, and the night before Heyman convinced him to go to uh, the China Club, Paul had a small sports car, and when Taker sat down, he tore a hole in his back pants. So, he had a hole in his back pants. Hilarious, huh? Probably not as funny to Taker, but hilarious. Hole in the pants. <laughs> um, Heyman said, don't worry about it. We'll get some girls... <laughs> We'll get someone's mom to sew it up with a sewing kit. Man, come on. This is hilarious stuff. <laughs> okay, so he goes to meet Vince. And during this conversation, I don't know why Taker said this, but he tells Vince McMahon that he sings in the shower. He let it slip that he can sing in the shower. And I went, oh, no. You don't want to tell Vince McMahon that. <laughs> no. But he immediately knew it was a mistake. He's like, oh, fuck. I'm done. I'm done. Because now he's going to get this stupid-ass gimmick where he's seen singing in the shower. That sounds exactly like something Vince would do. Come on. Around that time, he would have done that. He would have done that. Don't think he wouldn't have. But he didn't. Vince just told them we had nothing for you. But eventually they did. Because guess what? They called him up on the phone, and I love this story. Vince called Taker on the, on the phone and said, Is this the Undertaker? Again, he, he wasn't Taker yet. He was still Mark Calloway. He's all like, who the fuck is the Undertaker? Oh, that's me! Yeah! <laughs> I think he said he, it, was, um, it was one of those situations where he thought he was being pranked. Uh, it was someone trying to get him. But then he was all like, I, I, it's not... It's not Eggman. By the way... I skipped that story. Rewind real quick. So before we got to Vince McMahon, he was watching, I think, I don't know like what period of time this was happening, but he was watching uh, WWE TV around the time they were doing the egg angle, which would be revealed to be the Goblin Gooker, by the way, but they were doing that whole angle for months. Who's coming out of the egg? And Taker thought it was going to be him. And he's all like, oh no, I'm going to be Eggman. He started making these jokes like Taker's going to shave his head bald and manscape his body. And he's going to be called Eggman. He's going to be coming out of that egg looking like Mr. Clean. And I, I, I died laughing when he said that. He's going he gonna to be having me come out this egg looking like Mr. Clean. I was like, yo, Taker, chill, bro. Chill. Man, you are. He is from Houston. He, he got that Houston humor, man. Okay, now, now let's skip forward to him debuting as Undertaker. I just had to get that story out the way. Love the Eggman comment. It, it was awesome. So, as you can imagine, Taker debuts. The kids are scared. It, it, they literally talk about how he had women and kids just frightened, terrified. I found these results. Shh. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, he starts talking about he got the concept from watching Mike Myers and Jason. I think we all kind of figured that one out. Yeah, it was... I'm still going to say it, it is literally the greatest gimmick ever created in WWE. Ever. There hasn't been a single gimmick that came close to this. And never will. Uh, Taker talks about watching WWF up, in, up until... Um, Wait, is that the Eggman story? Oh, what the hell? Why did I put this Lex? Okay, scratch this. Um, they show us some of the early artwork, which looked really, really cool. 
But then Austin asked him, okay, so during this time, you're, you know, getting the character together. Who are you talking to? Who's helping you make this character? Who's making it come out to be where it is? Because they show pictures of him working with Bruce Pritchard and Vince McMahon. But he's like, like, come on. Like, who really helped you come up with this? And then he said, guess. Taker said, guess who it was. And I think him, Austin, along with everyone else thought Vince McMahon. Nope. Not Vince McMahon. He said, Jake the Snake Roberts. When he said Jake's name, I lost it. I popped huge. I I loved it. I loved I loved the idea that Jake the Snake Roberts, one of the greatest one of the greatest characters, one of the greatest mic workers, one of the greatest performers ever, ever. GOAT. Top 50 greatest of all time. Might be top 20, honestly. But yeah, Jake the Snake Roberts basically told he told uh, Taker how to make it work. He gave him pointers. What a what a mentor! Holy crap! No wonder he no wonder he was so goddamn awesome. You you don't get any better than that. You know what I mean? But then they start talking about, and this is where we get real interesting with the character. They start talking about Taker and how he was living with the character, and he uses this time to you know he didn't knock. Modern day wrestling and all that kind of stuff. But Austin says, during this time, the point wasn't to have five star matches. You know, but instead, he needed to get the character over. And Taker says, you know, that's a fair assessment as he had to put his ego in check. Because he's watching all these matches with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and thinking, I can go out here and outwork every single one of you. I am a better performer than everyone in this arena, in this in this locker room. And you know something? I, I believe him. I, I I do believe during that time if Taker wanted to have five star matches, he would have. But it wasn't about that. You know, Taker says he would see guys tear the house down and he had to put he had to put his his willing pride, the pride away because he had to sell it a different way. You know, he talked about how instead of just going balls to the walls 24-7, like we would see nowadays with certain wrestlers, he would have to sell the character first, you know, do the whole slow, slow walk, no sell, take a hit, no sell, take a hit, no sell, and then all of a sudden, do a flying clothesline. And it actually got him over a lot more than it would have if he wrestled like Bret Hart. Although he could wrestle probably better than Bret Hart. But then he uses that to talk about modern day wrestling. And he does delve into modern day wrestling a little bit. How he feels like we're not we're not making characters no more. The concept of characters isn't what it used to be. Cause back then, the wrestlers they were their characters when they left the ring, when they went into the arenas, when they went to sleep and woke up, they were still who they were. Taker said, I lived the Undertaker. I was Undertaker in the bar. Uh, at the grocery store, in my bed when I went to sleep, he lived the gimmick. If you go in his house, he said he has nothing but dark clothes in his closet. He was Undertaker, through and through, which was, it was mind-boggling when I heard that. I was like, damn. Like, that That must, and I heard about that kind of um, acting, method acting that a lot of actors do. That can be dangerous. It can be mentally dangerous, depending on what, what you're, what you're playing, what role you're playing. For him, it was probably natural. Apparently, it was. But he even said it was like second nature to him. It worked because he, he's a cool guy like that. Regardless, it was very interesting hearing that because it said a lot about who he was. He took this seriously. He took this thing like, if, if this doesn't work, I'm done. I'm going all in with this, and I'm so happy he did that. Austin talks about how often Taker has been able to change his gimmick and make it work. Uh, for a lot of guys, leaving that character would have, you know, been career suicide. And he talks about how he went from the transition from, you know, classic Undertaker, the dead man, to the American badass. And Taker said he needed, 
he needed that character change. He doesn't think his Taker character would have lasted all the way through the Attitude Era if he didn't make that character change. Because he felt handcuffed. He said he felt handcuffed by the character, and that is why he came back with the American Badass. This was like around 2000. Judgment Day 2000. Yes, it was. I remember that. I was there. Uh, not there, there in the arena, but I, I was watching the pay-per-view. Anyways, it also gave him the ability to bring the dead man character back years later and mold everything together, like a fusion of all the characters. Because we got Classic Taker, uh, we have uh, Ministry of Darkness Taker, which he doesn't talk about too much. Kind of wish he would. That alone could be another 30 minutes, but he skipped over that one. I don't think he liked it. But you had Big Evil, which was the heel version of a dead man, a dead man, uh, sorry, wrong one. I was gonna say, dead man walking, you done it now, uh, American Badass, that's what I meant to say. And then eventually we get to Modern Day Undertaker, which is like a fusion of all the characters. Uh, again, he was adapting with the times. Real quick, there is a side of me that kind of wishes, like around 2000 and, I'll say about 2000 and, 10, maybe 2009, around that point, he would have changed up the character one more time. Maybe add a different element, maybe bring a little bit more of the old school Ministry of Darkness taker into the into the into the fold. Uh maybe go back to the American Badass. Like make a small short stunt, start stint as the American Badass again just to change things up. Cause I feel like it, it was getting a little stale around that time. Now, luckily, not too long after that, he stopped showing up and only wrestled once a year. So it was kept fresh because of that. WWE acts like Biker Taker never existed. I don't even know why. I loved Undertaker as the American Badass. That is one of the most underrated gimmicks ever. It is. People don't talk about it enough. It was it was awesome. Some of his best matches was as American Badass Undertaker. Okay, so we talk about when he actually debuted as the American Badass. Taker says he was nerve. It was nerve wracking, as he had been gone for nearly a year. Uh, he was only he was not only coming back, but he was in a completely different gimmick. If it doesn't work, he's screwed, and it worked. Uh, we start talking about his injuries now, and goodness gracious, Taker has all long list of injuries from leg injuries to tearing his pec to concussions to groin injuries it, it just the list is just filled up of all kinds of stuff and then they talk about well they they do mention his love of jack by the way a shot of jack whiskey which you know that was that's very nice uh, he's very competitive I think they told a story, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but they tell a story of someone challenging him to a drinking contest, and he just drunk him under the table. And I'm going to let you guys go watch that part. Uh, Austin brings up the famous picture from back on the bus. Back on the bus, and Taker says it's famous because of, uh, I think they're just talking about uh, their time in the past with Hall and Nash and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's not important. But this is when Austin does ask Taker, why come? Why did you never go to WCW? How come during the Monday Night Wars, when you could have jumped, why didn't you jump? And that's when Taker mentioned, because I remember what WCW told me. They told me I would never draw a dime. Why would I ever go back to them? Why would I ever go back to them and leave the guy that gave me the opportunity to get over and become someone important? Now, he does mention how he hated the fact that that WCW was a better program than them. And Austin was talking about, uh, I thought we were the better show. Taker was like, no, we weren't. <laughs> Taker was like, uh-uh, no, we weren't. WCW had the better show. And he hated it, and it, it, it really ate him up inside because they were doing things that he wanted to do in WWF. Now, they eventually started doing that with the Attitude Era, but this was back in, like, 1996, where the game, oh, goodness gracious, the, it, it, was, it was not even close with how good of a show WWF would eventually become. Like from 1994, I'll probably even say 1993, to about early 1996 was a horrible period for WWE, WWF. That was just a 
horrible time to be a fan of the company. Things got better at the tail end of 1996, and then really kicked up a gear, kicked up things in 1997. And then 1998, Adrian Aaron, we're off with the races. Uh, he asked him about the curtain call. Uh, Taker said, I wasn't there. I knew nothing about that. Austin wants to know how close Taker was to Vince. Taker says they have a really good creative, creative relationship. The character was Vince's vision. That's Vince's creation. But he gave him a lot of slack to do things. You know, Taker was able to take some leeway to work the character, which anytime you can get that kind of freedom, that's how you make stars. And I don't think Vince, well, I don't think he does nowadays, but maybe he does. It doesn't feel like he does that with a lot of the people nowadays. I feel like he's gotten more of a stranglehold on the roster, which is hard. And that's, that's sad to hear. Uh, Taker mentions he never thought of himself as a locker room leader, but he, but he has just been there so long that he just earned the respect of the locker room. He just naturally got respected. They never talked about him uh, leading wrestling court. They never talked about wrestling court. Like, I'm telling y'all, there is a lot of stories they can tell that can go at least three hours. This was only an hour and a half, and I feel like we... We got a lot more to go. So if they ever want to do a part two, I'm there. Um, let's see here. This is when Austin brings up his his programs with Shawn Michaels and Triple H and said this was around the time that Taker was having five-star matches. I, I got to say this real quickly. That entire series of matches with Shawn Michaels and Triple H all the way up to Hell in a Cell and at WrestleMania 28, the end of an era Hell in a Cell match, that might go down as one of the greatest long-term long -term storylines ever in WWE history. That four-year period, which he calls a four-year program, I don't think it was. I don't think it was meant to be that. It just ended up being that. But it was a four-year program. Everything about that was freaking amazing. I I I look back on that fondly. And I'm biased because I was at the WrestleMania where he fought Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25. Love that match. It is easily the best wrestling match for me at a WrestleMania. Still to this day, nothing has stopped it. But it, it, it's really cool hearing them talk about it because... And the, and the one thing I really liked about it too was during um, the discussion, they mentioned the part where Taker, Triple H, and Shawn Michaels go up on stage, right? And then they all turn around to face the audience. That wasn't booked. That wasn't scripted. That was that was them just kind of reacting. That was an organic moment. It wasn't planned. And it was it was crazy hearing that because y'all, that's one of the most iconic things in WrestleMania history. Sometimes the best things in wrestling are not scripted, which is playing into the reason why I hate scripted promos. I hate shows that are scripted. I hate everything about what's happening with WWE and how it is it's choking the life out of their product by just making everything so micromanaged and overproduced. I hate it. Because you're, you're not going to get moments like that ever again with the way the product is. I don't think Undertaker would be able to do what he did back then nowadays. I don't think anybody, top 10 greatest of all time to me, Macho Man Randy Savage, Andre the Giant, Bret Hart, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Ric Flair, 99 Order, uh, The Rock, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold, Undertaker, none of those guys would get over nowadays. If we just stop and think about that now, just right now, in this space, none of those guys would be who they are if they debuted nowadays. That should tell you we have an issue with WWE. A major issue. But, sorry. He continues. Austin asks Taker how long the high from a good match carried him. Because that match was amazing. And Taker says, not long. Because as soon as the pain, uh, well, as soon as the adrenaline ran off. Because, you know, when you're wrestling, the adrenaline's up. And so you don't feel a lot of pain. But when it all comes down, that's when everything hits him. He says, 
for a long time now, the, the reason why he was doing the whole one year thing, the one match a year thing, is because every time he wrestled and the match was done, he would be hit with pain. Just excruciating pain. You want to know why? Because his body's too old now. His body isn't what it used to be. When you take bumps for 30, 40 minutes, that shit hurts. You feel that. And he said there were times when it would last weeks. He said, oh, this is this is what it is. I, I, I guess I guess I'm going to have to deal with this for the next few weeks. And Austin was like, dude, is it worth it? And Taker said, yeah, it's worth it. I, 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 I couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it, y'all. I, I had to respect Taker. No wonder he's the most respected man in the business. Like, nobody else would have done what he did. Because if I'm to the point where one match puts me in a week, not, not a week, but weeks of pain, I'm done. It's not worth it, man. It ain't worth it no more. Not for me, but for him it was. And this was happening during the end of an era. Guys, that was 2012. That was seven years ago. We still have a lot more matches to go, but let's see here. What's next? They show Taker putting his boots and gloves in the ring at WrestleMania 33. Oh, man. Here we go. This is when he gets kind of sad. So, he says that, and this is when Taker starts talking more about himself, like what he was feeling around this time. He says, everyone from his generation is gone. From this point forward, it's not about having good matches. It's not about anything else but him, his pride. He wants to be able to know, he wants to know that can he still do it at this age. It's a challenge. It's all a challenge to him. He's a very competitive soul. We talk about the whole treating people under the table thing. That's this is who he is. He's competitive. He wants to know, all right, can I still do it at this age? Can I still have end of an era quality matches, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania quality matches at this point in my life? And I'm hearing this and I'm you know, again, I respect Taker. I'm not gonna be one of those fans that say you're stupid for not calling it when it was when it was when it was clearly not gonna get better than what you had. We all knew that as soon as end of an era was over with, it's not getting better than this. This is it. This is it. This this is it, dude. It and even now, I can sit here and tell you it didn't. It hasn't gotten any better than that. But still, you know, when you hear that, you go, oh Lord, man. Uh but the thing is, and this should be said, although by this point he's doing it for the challenge, he's doing it as a favor to Vince, uh, and he'll admit, and he, he even admitted, he admits there have been matches where he thought he stayed too long. And we do, I don't know if you guys have seen this promo, but he does mention the promo where, well, the interview, it wasn't a promo, it was like a promo, but it was an interview where he said, I would hate to be that wrestler that stayed too long and became a parody of himself. You know? His demon is becoming a parody of himself. And y'all, man, like, when when you reveal to the world that your demon is becoming a parody of yourself, like, that is his worst demon. That That is the worst thing that could ever happen to him. And you see what he is now. Like, man, like, who who wants to be the guy? Who wants to be that guy, that person to tell Taker you are a parody of yourself? After he revealed that, that's the worst thing you could tell him. Man, that's, that's sad. But after WrestleMania 33, after Roman Reigns beat him, he thought he was gone. That's why he put his boots and gloves in the center of the ring. But he was talked into coming back. By who? Vince McMahon. Jesus Christ, Vince. Austin brings up being done at WrestleMania. You know, it was perfect. WrestleMania 19 with The Rock. He said it was perfect. And he admits he should have brought up the streak. You know? Uh, he That leads to talk of... 
Here we go. This is when it gets real sad. They start talking about WrestleMania 30, where he lost a streak, got beaten by Brock Lesnar. Austin wants to know if that was a good time to walk away. Because it's like, all right, we're talking about WrestleMania 33. Why didn't you leave when the streak was over? The whole point of Taker being who he was was the WrestleMania streak. That was done. Why did you stay? <sighs> this is hard for me to say. Taker says that within the first five minutes of the match, he suffered a concussion. And it was so bad that he literally doesn't remember that night at all. He doesn't remember the night he lost his streak. He doesn't. He remembers nothing about that match. Nothing about the match. Nothing about the two-hour process that he had to do to get ready for the match. Doesn't remember going backstage and fainting. Getting carried out to the hospital. This is what he says. His memory, I think his memory starts that morning. And then continues when he woke up at the hospital. Everything between that, he doesn't remember. That is, that is all kinds of just horrifying, man. That's one of those stories you hear, you go, I never want to be a wrestler. I, I don't ever want to experience that. He couldn't remember his name. He couldn't remember his birthday. Didn't know where he was. What city he was in. It was, it was bad, y'all. It was really bad. Like, that's... Uh, but he, he continues, you know, the only thing he remembered was his wife's first name, Michelle. Michelle McCool. Uh, he had no clue of, about anything else. Taker says it was nothing Brock did and that Brock also didn't know he was concussed. Brock didn't know. No one knew. He says... The, this is when we start getting a little sad. He says that match screwed up his confidence, which is weird to say. Most think after 25 years, you wouldn't get shook. But it happened. He got shook. I get shook too. That's when he started questioning, okay, should I continue to do this? I think it's time for me to walk away. He actually questioned himself, but he came back. And he said the reason he came back is because he refused to let that be his last match. He refuses to let his last match be a match he doesn't remember. I hear that. And while I, don't, while I sympathize with him, and let me tell y'all something. like, uh, I was there when he lost the streak. I remember how bad that match was. I'm not going to lie. I don't think it should have ended with that match either. I think a lot of us like to tell ourselves it should have ended when the streak ended. Should it really? Like, just honestly, God, think about this. If the, if the career of The Undertaker ended with that horrible-ass match, if it ended on that note, would, would we have been okay with it? Seriously. Would, would we as a fan base be able to live with ourselves? If that was his last match. I don't know. Like, for me, no. Nah, bro. It, it, it wasn't it for me. That I, I don't like the fact that he continued to wrestle, but in a way, I'm kind of glad he did. Because he deserved to go out on a better note. That That's that's just sad. Um. Anyways, Austin brings up their match at SummerSlam 1998. In the garden where he got concussed only two minutes into the match. And Austin says, I can relate to how you feel because even till this day, Austin is still irritated to uh he still is still irritated to this day that he couldn't give Taker his best match that night. Taker tells him that things happen and he shouldn't feel bad. I would I remember watching the match. I thought the match was still great. But Austin doesn't remember the match. So he thinks he gave him a terrible match. Doesn't blame Brock, doesn't blame Austin or anybody. Uh, but he continues. Austin says that maybe he could be around wrestling still too if he had the information people do now with training and you know nutrition. 
Taker says, Taker says he has only come across one person who has had peace with the decision to leave. We all know who it is. Shawn Michaels, HBK. He thinks it may have been a blessing for Steve as he didn't have to make that decision. He says Steve was smart enough to know the long-term effects. Ticker says, Ticker says there are days he feels great. And again, it's sad when you hear this. There are days he feels great, but other days are so bad. It's like, it's like he can't even do anything, man. Like, your body, that, but again, like, man, that's scary because it shows you what this business does to you over time. What kind of impact bumping, not just on a weekly basis, sometimes days, days in and days out, what that does to you long term. And that's why I always say these men, men and women, put their bodies on the line for us. They sacrifice their health and they shorten their lives for our entertainment, which is why they deserve respect. I don't think anyone deserves more respect than Undertaker, man. Like, these stories are just. They're haunting. Uh, but it becomes dangerous where you try to work with fear. Because he, he, every time he gets in the ring, it's like, I'm scared, man. You know? But that's when they bring in his match with Goldberg. He brings up the match with Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. And Steve says, and this is the nicest thing he ever said, that was a tough day at the office. That was a tough day at the office. That... Man, that had to be, well, it's going to go down as one of the worst matches in 2019. But that might be Taker's worst match. One of his worst matches ever. I had to compare it to Johnny, Gonz uh, Gi Johnny Gonzalez. Uh, Johnny Gonzalez. Uh, and uh, his match with Boss Man, Big Boss Man. He's had a lot of bad matches. That one might be one of his worst. Uh, we don't get much time. About this match, Taker doesn't spend too much time on it. Uh, all Taker says is, Pride is a son of a bitch, as he wasn't going to go out on that note. He knew that as soon as that match with Goldberg happened, I gotta come back and have another match. And the match at Extreme Rules was actually pretty good. It was pretty good. But then he, he jokes about how he retired 15 times. He does. He, you gotta joke about it at this point, but... Anyways, he jokes about how he has retired 15 times. As, as he tells his wife, he is done after each match. And she just rolls her eyes and goes, yeah, until you go back to train again. So he, he knows. He knows, guys. So b before any of y'all say, does he realize what he's becoming? He does. He does. He's aware. He can't let it go. Taker can't let it go, man. And that's when he says, if someone comes to him and says that it's time, you know, it's time to cut it, it's time to stop, man. It better be someone like Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, or Triple H, who he respects. He even said, unless it's you, Shawn, or Triple H, I'm not going to leave. I'll leave on my own terms. He's not going to let. Just a random fan like me say, retire. He says, no, I'll retire on my own terms. The only people that can tell him to retire are Shawn Michaels, Undertake, uh, yeah, himself, Shawn Michaels, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Triple H. And that's where you go, why would you give them that kind of a responsibility, though? No one, why would they ever want to tell Taker to retire? That's not right. I don't, I don't like that at all. What? No one wants the responsibility of telling the Undertaker to hang it up. No one wants that responsibility. Who wants that responsibility? But unfortunately, that's what's going to have to happen. Taker is either going to have to decide himself, I'm done, which more than likely he won't. Taker's way too competitive to cut it. He can't. He, he can't. He, he's, he's not able to let it go. So it's either going to have to be Austin, Sean, or Triple H to say, stop. But I don't know, man. And that's when they start telling stories about <laughs> the plane ride from hell, all the times that 
Um, Austin almost made take or break character. Uh, the stuff with the Taker Rooney, one of the one of my favorite all time after Raw segments was that whole debacle with them trying to get Taker to do the Spinner Rooney. I love it. I watch it almost every single week. It's really, really great. One of my favorites. Austin apologized. Uh, and uh, I think it was like because he did a match with Taker in 2001, Insurrection, where he almost ripped off his ear. So there was that. Uh, they talked about some kind of a... This was crazy. They were at a soccer stadium in Kuwait, and there were like 800 people. And because they had a, a crazy crazy short small crowd they were just scooping around and doing stupid things uh, that story was great uh, we jumped to I think that's when they wrap it up right yeah that's when they wrap it up Austin wraps things up and knows they will barely that they barely scratch the surface and thinks they need to do another one together so real quick just kind of do again love love the entire session but just to kind of do a recap on what they missed. They didn't talk about wrestling court. Wrestle court. What do you call that? Wrestling court? When Taker was a judge and all the stories of people having to give him Jack. You know, the, the whole craziness about, you know, if you did something bad, you had to get judged. We have a, you know, a, a, a freaking, um, why am I blanking on how, how, my goodness, why am I blanking on how this works? A courtroom works. Jury, thank you. You had a jury. You had the people there to listen to it, to defend it. You had a judge. You had a lawyer and all that kind of stuff. It was really, really cool. Taker was always a judge. He was always a judge. Never talked about that. Didn't, didn't even touch Ministry of Darkness Taker. Which is interesting because that's one of his well-known gimmicks. His best gimmicks. Didn't touch that. Um, skipped over his return, his feud with Kane, didn't touch about, didn't touch his feud with Kane. Didn't even touch it. Um, skipped over a lot of things, his feud with Randy Orton. Um, I'm thinking about some stuff I want to hear him talk about. Didn't talk about CM Punk. That's an interesting topic there. Um, didn't talk about anything when it comes to modern day wrestling. He mentioned it. He kind of touched on it with the whole characters and stuff like that, but he didn't get into anything when it comes to modern day WWE. What's lacking? What's it missing? Didn't touch on any of that. So, in my opinion, we should do a part two. Because there's so much more things to talk about. I want to know what Taker thinks about modern day WWE and what's missing. For real. They should do a part two. And I think it should be set for next year. That's just how I feel. And also, one more thing. They touched on the streak. But they didn't delve into the streak. Like, what, what does it mean to you? You know? So many things we could talk about. What, what's, what, what's your... What's your um, favorite streak match? So many questions we could ask. Um, one more thing we didn't talk about. Hell in a Cell. With Mick Foley in 1998, skipped all, skipped over that like it was nothing. There's so, there are so many things we could have talked about, guys. Taker's, Taker's career is so big. If they were to do a documentary on it, it would at least have to be three hours, probably more. I think it would have to be three hours. A full documentary on Taker's career would be at least three hours, probably more. Probably somewhere around three and a half, maybe four hours. It would be that long. But yeah, man. It, it, crazy, crazy stuff. Loved it. Thought it was amazing. If you haven't seen it, go out of your way to talk about it. Please go out of your way to talk about it, but after you see it. Go out of your way to see it so you can talk, talk about it. Now, um, other than that, that's about it. I don't really have anything else to say about what they talked about. I thought it was a great interview. I'm curious to know what you guys think. So, if you're watching this live, when this goes up in the comments, I have a question for you. Well, two, I guess. First question is, how do you feel about Seth Rollins turning heel? You can say what you want about that. But my second question is, 
what did you feel about Taker saying he doesn't remember WrestleMania 30? Like, like, honestly, say what you want about the interview. You can say whatever you want, your favorite part, whatever. But I'm very curious to know how people felt when they heard Taker say, I don't remember a goddamn thing about the streak ending. Like, how did that make you feel? How did that impact you? Because that, that is a very scary, dark moment to hear. But, yeah. Um, I hope there's a part two. Hell, we might need a part three. But I definitely heard, hope there's a part two. I can hear those guys talk all day. All right, guys. I'm not going to keep you here too long. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for the donations. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'll catch you guys next time for more content. We're going to finish things off this week. Again, this is the last week of reviews. We got... Uh, NXT and AEW coming up, and then SmackDown. And then once December hits, it's basically me getting the channel ready for the change in um, January. And throughout the month of December, we got uh, what fans want versus what corporate wants in NXT. We got how to make a baby face. We got that coming up. And we're going to do some other things, too. Oh, any of the year awards. And then I do want to do one more podcast. And I might end the year with this. Where I bring in Preston from Wrestling Paradise. And, you know, hopefully I can go live and we'll just do a Q&A or whatever. And we'll just have some fun. You know, I just it, it just feels like it will be the, 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 the perfect closure. Uh, the, pulpic, the perfect closure for Delex Man. You kind of can't. I don't think there would be a Delex Man if that guy didn't exist. Just saying. So, I think I just kind of gave you an outlook of what's to happen. If anything crazy happens within that time and I have to talk about it, I will. But until then, thank you guys for watching. Give me your thoughts about Taker's interview. I'll see you guys next time in Delex Man's world. I'm tired, so I'm going to get out of here. Peace.